So it's about this close, right? All right. So uh, yeah, my name is Hugh McKee. I'm a developer advocate at Lightbin. So um, I started there about a year and a half ago. And before that, I uh, was at HP for like ever. Long, long time. Uh, IT for a long time and did consulting before that, stuff like that. So I kind of came from the, the, the corp uh, corporate world um, in, in the IT space and, and did Java, has been doing Java since uh, it started. But um, this talk, you know, as, as Jason mentioned, we have a, this microservice framework called Lagam. It's not the only way to build microservices. We, you know, there's any number of different ways. I mean, basically, you need code to handle uh, like communications coming in and do persistence, things like that. So people are building microservices using all kinds of different technologies. But in this talk, um, I wanted to uh, focus somewhat on the architectural considerations for microservices. And it'll lead into some of the characteristics of how microservices are implemented using Logom. And not just Logom, are you guys familiar with ACA? It's a, you know, it's a, the actor, it's an actor system on the JVM. It's, you can do it in Java, you can do it in Scala. So some of the fundamentals of what you can do uh, and what I'll be talking about, things like event sourcing and CQRS um, are part of Logom, they're part of, you know, people use Play to do it, people use, ACA to do it, things like that. So this is primarily a, a, a talk about things in a, the microservice space from an architectural perspective. So I, I call it safe passage, and it's messaging in a distributed system. So to me, this is a really interesting area because growing up in um, HP, I, and I put this on my bio, I've got a, long ex a lot of experience building really brittle systems that break and fail. Um, and it drove me nuts because for much of my career, I got called in. You know, when things broke, we had a production outage, you get called on the carpet. You know, they call them escalations. And you go in, you, you, and you're there, and you're there for however long it takes to fix things. And we had some pretty brutal ex escalations, like on the weekends when your family's beating on you to be with them, and you're not because you're stuck trying to fix a production outage. And th those things really hurt. And I did it a lot. And this is why I kind of fell in love with some of the technology that Light, Lightbend has, in particular things like Akka. So on the, 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 um, the safe passage, the, there's this whole, as you guys are probably very aware, and you're probably doing this, and I'll be curious to hear what, what some of you guys are doing, there's this big modernization that seems to be occurring across the industry, that there's all kinds of changes that are occurring the way we build systems, and there's just lots and lots of things happening. And just really quick, it, there's a lot of things driving it, but there's things like, you know, customers, the patience for systems with customers is like in the milliseconds. It, you know, like I have a wife and a daughter, if their apps don't work right, they complain to me, and then they're gone. You know, they're on to the next app, right? They're just gone. You lose them. The, uh, the business is getting just as demanding, you know, that they want to be able to make changes really quickly and get them in, into production. Again, I grew up in an environment where we had, like, six-month release cycles. And I, I could never understand how the business would tolerate that, you know, waiting six months for the next features to be rolled out in production. Today, that's not an option anymore. Oh, I'm sorry. The biggest one, I think, though... And I read a bunch of stuff about this. I, I got to stay away from Twitter because I had like three epiphanies that this morning on Twitter, just looking at some of the articles over there, um, is data and traffic. That um, I think we're on the beginning of the, the, the exponential growth. You know, there's this exponential curve that's happening. I think we're on the kind of on the upside of it right now where the volume of data that a lot of your systems are going to have to process is going to skyrocket. They're talking, I don't know if any of you guys are doing any kind of IoT yet, or if you're de dealing with systems that have lots of users, but I think all of us are going to see those kinds of uh, things happening in our system with this, where the, the volumes that our systems are going to have to handle is going to grow significantly. So in a way, um, I always try to put a positive spin on things. I'm more of an optimist than a pessimist that I feel like we're in the this renaissance in system architecture. That the, you know, things like microservices and, and you know, streaming data and 
machine learning and all these things that are happening are just massive changes compared to the types of things that we've been doing before. I mean, I've got, uh, I'll be honest, I've got decades of experience of building you know, monolithic systems. And all, now, all these new, ar new architectures, these new technologies are coming on board and they're, they're getting traction really, really quick. I've never seen anything like it. So things do kind of start um, with the monolith. Uh, anybody recognize this picture? It's okay. It's um, 2001 from a movie that's it's going to be 50 years. If you haven't, if you're any kind of a sci-fi nut, you've had to have seen this. But it's a movie. It, it'll be 50 years old next year. I can't believe it. Anyways, a lot of the talk starts with the monolith, and the monolith. The way I look at a monolith is that you've got this system that's composed of code and data. And a lot of times we focus on the code, but I think it actually ends up being that there's more focus that's needed on, on the data itself. So I don't know if you guys have heard this term before, but sometimes people are referring to monoliths as a big ball of mud. And I don't quite like that term because I don't like throwing mud at you know technology that I spend so much time on. But um, the reason why this is brought up is that in many cases, some systems grow to the point where there's a large team of people working on it. There's a lot of um, uh, coupling that goes, goes on. Like if, if I'm working on one module and you're working on another module and, we want, and I want to make a change, I probably have to talk to you because maybe we're sharing some APIs, we're, we're sharing some parts of the database, the schemas, things like that. And so there's all this kind of um, you know, building the system by committee. And that, that can take some time to get things done. This is why in the past, you know, I built systems that had six month release cycles because it wasn't, we were coding heads down for six months. We were probably arguing and talking for six months, you know, things like that. But I'm not here to badmouth the, the, the monolith. I think the monolith is, is a really mature, solid technology. We know how to build these kinds of systems. We've been building for a long time and they're not gonna go away. You know, so I'm not saying, oh yeah, you got to go screaming away from, from monoliths and do all the cool stuff. I'm not saying that. Um, it, it, they're here, for, I think they're here for, for quite a long time. And they have good characteristics. I mean, we know how to do build monoliths. We know how to run them. We know how to make them pretty reliable and do what they need to do in production. So there's things like scaling and, and so on. You know, we say you can run it on multiple nodes um, and, and have, you know, good reliability, good performance, and, and, and handle the load pretty well. But the challenge has always been in, um, in setting up systems. It's like, how many of you have ever been in a situation where it's like, all right, we're building this new system, and they say, well, how much capacity or how, much, you know, how, how big is this thing going to be when we go into production? And you, you should know, right? And, and you sit there and go, well, okay. And you, you have to guess. It's like, yeah, we need a system this big. You know, and, and you're, you're kind of taking a guess at it. And... Um, the, the challenge, though, is that you're, in many cases you're talking about some bucks, right? Because you're talking about having to buy systems or, or if you're on the cloud, having a certain amount of capacity. Now, the things that, with the cloud have made things a lot better now because it's like, oh, that system's too small or that system's too big. Now we can change that more quickly. But if you're dealing with in-house systems, it might be harder. Like, I had to beg for months to get a machine where I was at before we went to the cloud. It drove me nuts. We, you know, we had spent time in meetings, and you fill out paperwork and all this stuff, and then finally you get a machine. And then you go to the cloud and say, like, oh, what do you need? Ten machines? Dink, you know, and they're up. Um, but still, there's this kind of balancing act, and you're trying to have enough capacity to handle the load, but not too much. And you're trying to deal with those spikes, you know. And um, again, at HP, we had all this um, hardware and one of the things that drove the IT management nuts was the utilization was usually around 10%. We had tens of thousands of machines, and the utilization was around 10%. Drove them absolutely crazy because we had to over, kind of, you know, over uh, scale for, you know, for those spikes in production, the heavy loads. And this is the challenge, is that if you don't um, scale enough, you run into these situations when, as, as your loads are going up, the system can't go any faster. And... You know, um, I think it was just this, this week uh, in China, it's actually bigger than Black Friday. It's 11-11. It's Singles Day. It's the biggest shopping day in the world. 
and uh, I, it's and I, I forget the volumes, but they're bigger, I think, than Black Friday or Cyber Monday. But uh, we've got Black Friday and Cyber Monday coming up, and every year, I, I remember last year I did another presentation and I put like listed the name of the companies that were in the press because they they failed, you know, they they buckled under the load under on, on those high uh, high volume days. And it was because they're, you know, they didn't have enough capacity or the architecture couldn't go any faster, no matter how much hardware you throw at it. And I've been in that kind of situation, like the database won't go any faster and you're, you're in a world of hurt. And it really comes down to um, things like the Amdo's law, which is this, you can only make a system go so fast and it's really based on the, the amount of parallelism that you can put into the system. So th this is, um, it's kind of intuitive to me. I mean, if you look at this up in Wikipedia, there's some math to it. Um, Amdo's law, it, it kind of has a, a nice equation for how much throughput you're gonna get, and this is where these graphs come from. But basically, it comes down to the, the potential for parallelism in your systems, and how much you can get out of adding more hardware. And the things that inhibit parallelism is things like you get some point of contention. And I'm, I'm picking on the database here, but often that's what I ran into. The database is your choke point. It can only go so fast and won't go any faster, depending on what database technology you're using. The, uh, the other thing is, and it, is it, you have a, maybe a single point of failure. You, the, you know, these are the production outages and you get called in and you gotta fix it, those types of things. So these are not good places to be. So, so th these are kind of the, um, some of the inspiration, not all. You know, there's other things like you want to go faster, you want to be able to uh, address the businesses quick, more quickly. But these are some of the motivations for looking into the new ways of building systems, and you know, the, the, you know, like modernizing. You know, the the digital transformation that a lot of uh, things people talk about. So, um, how many guys are working with, on what you would call a, kind of a monolithic environment? How many guys are doing microservice stuff? Any kind? Okay, so it's about half and half. So okay, kind of getting cool. Um, so here I wanted to just quickly kind of go through what I'm seeing some people are doing to move from monoliths into uh, microservices. So one way, and maybe you guys are already doing this, is you start carving off parts of the monolith and you replace it with that you know that that functionality with some form of a microservice. And you start to you, you start to gradually reduce the dependency on the on the monolith and you're starting to move towards a more distributed, more nimble, you know, kind of a system using uh, some kind some form of a microservice implementation. Now um, this is carving off the code though, what I'm showing here. It's not yet carving off the data. We'll get into that in a bit. And um, you'll often hear of this called a uh, I mean, you're building microservices because the code basically is microservices, but often you'll hear of these things called like a distributed monolith because you still have a, mon you, you know, you, you carved off the code, but you still have a monolithic database. And that might still be your choke, choke point. It might still be your, your single point of failure. Um, as I'm showing here. You know, so the, the idea with microservices, I really like, kind of like these two just these are goals. I, I'm not. I don't want to. I don't want to be coming. I don't want to come across here saying like you have to do these types of things. I'm just. I want to come across more of these are these are goals. These are things to think about when you're building systems and looking at the architectures. So I like this. There's strong cohesion on the inside, and there's loose coupling on the outside. And the more I thought about it, the really the, I really like this because strong cohesion means things like. When you look at building a service, you're building a service that kind of does one thing. It's really focused on doing one thing, like handling orders or handling a customer, you know, things like that. And then that one's, you know, if, you, if you're doing things like domain-driven design and so on, that you know, a lot of people are looking at that to help them come up with you know, what microservices or you know, how is my system actually organized. But the other part is the loose coupling, because the loose coupling gives you a lot of things. It's things like, um, it gives you the ability to um, change microservices quickly because you don't have to have that committee anymore. You know, you're, you're looking for those kinds of advantages. You know, it gives you the ability to move forward quickly. So I've kind of got 
three general goals or general, general characteristics that I ask people about when they say they're doing microservices and, and trying to move towards you know, loosely coupled microservices. So one is that it, a microservice should be independently deployable. And that was pretty, pretty straightforward because if you've broken out the code into a separate thing, then more, um, it's most likely that you're gonna be able to deploy that to production quickly. This one's harder though. It owns its own schema. This one goes into like dangerous territory. Depending on how much discipline you have in your organization on, on your data, this one can be really, really rough. But this is a goal and, and you're doing this to, to get loose coupling, right? Because if you own your own schema, then when you're working on that microservice, you can decide what the data looks like. It's not, it's up to you. It's not, you don't have to come to me, if, say I'm working on another part of the system. You can, you can decide what the data looks like inside of your uh, microservice. And then the other part is that the only way to get to your data is through the API to the microservice. And we're gonna be talking a lot about the APIs and the, the messaging between them. To give you an idea, how important some people take uh, consider this. This is a mandate that came out in Amazon way back in 2002. And it basically, basically said just what I mentioned, that the only way services interact with each other is through an interface, through an API. No cheating is what they also said. There's no back doors, there's no other way. And the final one that was set out, if you don't do this, you're fired. So they were serious. This was, I think, from Jeff Bezos back in 2002, way before the term microservice was out or anything like that. This is how seriously they took this. So there's, as I mentioned, there's the, there are those advantages to, to trying to reduce the coupling, you know, strong cohesion and loose coupling is you're getting that independence. You know, the system, the parts of the system can evolve at their own velocity. And the parts of the system can uh, run where if one part of the system is down, the, the entire system is not down. And a, a, a famous example that I, I've heard of is like at Netflix, for example, um, Netflix is famous for doing this. And they, uh, when you make a request to Netflix, it goes off and it fires off a bunch of requests to a whole bunch of different microservices. And one of them is say, making recommendations on shows and movies based on who you are. And say that service is down. So what, there'll be some kind of compensating action. You'll, the, the user doesn't necessarily know it's down. They might see like a default list of shows instead of a list of shows specifically tailored towards you because that service is offline. So the system keeps running. But the system, it really isn't like this nice little matrix of neat microservices, more of this kind of interconnected uh, community of services that not only interact with the you know, the devices on the edge with the users and things like that, but they, they interact with each other. And that's really wanna, where I want to dive into. So there was this really interesting couple of articles I ran into last, earlier this year, I think, uh, from a guy, uh, his name's Chris, Chris Richardson. And he, he's got this, um, uh, he's, he's a well-known speaker, does a lot of blogging, and he's got a site called microservice microservices.io. Anyways, he had these two, uh, two articles, and in the articles, one of the things he talked about was the interaction of, with, of a, a couple of microservices, and I, that's what I wanted to walk through. So in these two microservices, there's a, a service like an order service and a customer service. And the idea is that, say, the order service gets a request to place an order. So that's a transaction. You know, say the transaction occurs and the, and the order is captured. That triggers a message of some kind to go from the order service to the customer service to say, hey, an order, this order was just created. The customer service gets it and it does a credit check on the customer. And if the, the customer has sufficient credit, it does a second transaction and you know, reserves the credit. And then once the credit is reserved, then a, a response goes back or a message is sent back I'm not really getting into is this request response or asynchronous yet. Um, you know, the credit was reserved. And then this triggers a third transaction that the order was approved. So we have kind of the sequence of events that occurred 
there were three independent atomic transactions that occurred and a couple messages went back and forth. And if you look at this, in a monolith, this is probably done in a single transaction, right? Now, it's something that's done across a couple of services with messages. And, in, and it's done in three transactions, not one. So we're kind of in a new realm here. And this is what uh, I found really interesting, you know, kind of looking at it from the paranoid perspective. You know, so it's like, um, you know, the, uh, the, you know, the, where is this going to break? And the, of course, the area that you start thinking about where this is going to break is that um, you've got the messaging going back and forth. So you kind of have this um, scary bridge here where I know some people that wouldn't go on this bridge. I had a, another picture that was scarier, but I, I had to change it. But I, the point is that, you know, there's this, what looks like a really scary bridge here where things can break, like for our messages, the network's gonna go down, systems go down, things like that. What are we gonna do about it? But the reality is that um, it's not that scary, that there's actually a more, uh, there are ways to do these things that won't get you in trouble. And, but you've got to think about this right from the very beginning. When you're starting to implement systems, where you're starting to decompose, say, a monolith into services, and you're starting to do some really cool things like starting to message back and forth, um, you, you have to think about these things. It's things like, oh, yeah, we'll just implement this, and there'll be rest call here, rest call there, and everything's great. So it's like, yeah, it'll be great while everything's running, but when things break, then you're going to start losing messages. And in this, this scenario with the, the order and the customer, if we lose a message, we have orders that are stuck in a new state versus an approved state, you know, things like that, right? And now you're a jerk because once the, business, the user complains and says, hey, my order's stuck, and then the business finds out, and they come to you and say, hey, we got orders that are stuck, just a few of them. You've, you've delivered like 99.99% of the message, everything's fine but you got a few orders that are screwed up. What's wrong? And you look at it and go, oh, man. It's like, it's, you realize what's going on, and it's like, I've been here where now your management's going, is it fixed yet? Is it fixed yet? Is it fixed yet? You know, and you're looking at it, and you're going, what are you going to do? Because you've got some uh, serious architectural issues to deal with, you know, things that really need to change in order to not lose any messages, right? I mean, if you have a situation where it's okay to lose messages, that's fine. But in some cases, you're going to have situations where you can't lose any messages, none, zero. And that's where, I, you know, I wake up in a cold sweat at night going, oh, did, you know, <laughs> did I forget? So um, one of the things I like to do when, like, I, whenever somebody says, if this happens, I always say, change it to when when this happens, you know, what's going to, what will break, what's, what's going to happen, because it's, whatever can go wrong will go wrong at some point, and it's going to, it could potentially bite you. So just think about it here. You send the message over, well, um, when an order is created, well, maybe that message can't be sent, so now what do you do, right? Maybe the message made it to the other side, but before that second transaction occurred, it was in the middle of processing, but before it got to the commit, it failed. But maybe it, it, the, the second trans transaction did occur, but it was trying to send the response back, and that message didn't get back, right? It fails. And finally, just to be really paranoid, maybe it got all the way back, you're in the middle of processing the transaction, and it, you know, the, the machine failed that you're, you're processing on, the order went down, right? So you had some in-motion in transactions that were happening, but they didn't occur because the system goes down. Any one of those t these types of failure scenarios, you're going to lose a message. So the um, the question is: Is this a uh, this kind of a message exchange? Does it matter if it's an asynchronous or synchronous exchange? Would synchronous help us here versus asynchronous? Because often when we look at messaging like this, you hear about asynchronous messaging, but you know, things like the, the common thing is, is um, you know, the HTTP RESTful call, which is synchronous, would that make any difference in terms of reliability? And the answer, I think, is no. 
it's not going to make any difference. That, because this is, a, um, this is, by its nature, an asynchronous operation. You have one transaction, you know, the, the create order happened at time one. And no matter how you're, you implement the messaging, no matter what implementation approach, you're going to have the second transaction happen at time two, some other time, eventually happening, right? So there's nothing you can do to couple those things together. You know, uh, it's not going to be a two-phase commit type of an operation. We just don't do that anymore. So the, the, the inherent uh, feature of this is that messaging, no matter what implementation approach you use, is you got to think about it, I think, from a reliability standpoint as being an asynchronous type of an operation. So in this world, it's kind of goodbye to the big transactions that we know and love that work so well in a monolith. I mean, they work beautifully, right? Databases handle these transactions just fantastically. And the, you know, the databases do this really well. Our code does it really well. But now we're moving into this new realm where we don't have that luxury anymore. If you're gonna to wanna to decompose a big system down into something like a microservice system, uh, all this changes. And anybody, how many, uh, anybody using Kafka for anything? So Kafka is great, right? No question. But the, uh, the analogy, and maybe some people will not quite agree with me on this because some people don't like flying, but um, the analogy I'm trying to use here is that the, if you get in an airplane, you know, the, the odds of you getting to the other end, barring, say, weather or some kind of mechanical problem, is you're going to get to the, from your, your origin to your destination. It's just going to happen. But getting down that jetway or getting up the stairway, you've got um, a, a potential challenge here, right? You can fall down, you can trip, you, can, you know, and not get on the airplane. And this is the, the gap. There's a, a transaction occurred in your system, and then after that transaction occurs, you're gonna call Kafka to send a message into Kafka. Once it gets in Kafka, it's gonna go to the other side, but you've got this gap, right, between the transaction occurring and getting the message into Kafka. That if something fails after the transaction occurs and before the message gets into Kafka, you've lost that message and you have to deal with that. Same thing on the receiving end, that you, um, you, you can have the same problem. Kafka got it all the way to the other side, it will get it to the all, all the way to the other side, that's what it does. But getting it from Kafka, maybe into your uh, destination, th there's some potential areas where things can break and you'll, you can potentially lose, lose a message. So to deal with this, there's two approaches that are being used. There's a, what's called a pull approach and a push approach. Before I get into that, though, I wanted to uh, talk to you a little bit about um, messaging dynamics or the semantics of messaging. And in general, it, there's, it's called, uh, there's three ways of, of messaging. There's at most once, at least once, and exactly once. So at most once, I like to call it maybe once, where when I say I send you a message, uh, like I send you a text message. Now, I may not care if you get it, right? Because I'm just casually sending you a message. If you got it or not, I, I don't care. I'm, I'm going to go on my life. So if you get it, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine as well. That's, this is the way ACA works, by the way. ACA is, you know, actors talk to each other asynchronously through messaging. And fundamentally, that's how uh, messages are exchanged at, at most once. But I, I like to call it maybe once. So maybe the message will make it. Sometimes it won't. But there's the at least once, but I, I, like to, I like to think of this as once or more, meaning that if you use an at least once approach for messaging, you're going to uh, have the message delivered at least once, but in some cases, you're going to have the same message delivered more than once because it's retrying. Something failed on its first attempt, and there's scenarios, if you go back and look at the, you know, the failure scenarios that we walked through, there's some situations where the message arrived, but the sender doesn't know that the message arrived. You know, like when there's, the response couldn't be sent back, right? So if I'm sending you a message and you get it, but that you can't tell me that you got it, I'm going to try and send you the message again. And you may see the, mess, the same message twice. And then there's exactly once, which is... Um, I'd like to think of it as essentially once, meaning that you you have a form of at least once, but you're doing some 
um, filtering of messages. Like you, when you see the same message again on the, on the destination side, you filter it out so that the real recipient of the message doesn't see it more than once. Like it doesn't go in the database more than once, things like that. And there's some other tricks you can do to get close to exactly once, but exactly once is exceedingly difficult to do um, in a distributed system environment. And if Kafka uh, Confluent you know, came out with exactly once delivery earlier this year, which was really controversial, but in a way, I think they, they did a service for us because they were very open about how they implemented it and how, they, how it worked. And one po person pointed out to me that I thought this was really wise is that they helped to raise the level of discussion in the community about messaging in general and distributed systems. Where, because the fear is so many people say, oh yeah, I'll just rest it. You know, I just HTTP rest, I'll send the message over and what can go wrong? It's like, well, lots of stuff can go wrong. Um, how many guys, have you guys heard of the Simian Army at Netflix? This is a little aside. All right, so anybody doing it? No, I, I keep asking. Um, and I've never run into anybody who's doing it yet. So for, the, for those of you that don't, don't know, um, real quick, what Netflix does is they actually have a team and tools that go into production and break things in production. They do it, and they do it deliberately under controlled conditions. The, I think it's genius because the impact that it has on us as developers, I think, is significant. Because it's one thing to write code and put it in production and hope it never breaks. If it breaks, you know, you, you kind of push it off. You, you squint your eyes and you don't think about it. Versus you know that as soon as you put your stuff in production, that this team is going to come around and brutalize your code. And they're going to look for flaws in your code. And you, so you know that this is going to happen. And you don't want to get caught with you know, flaws in your code. So I, I think it's a real motivator to build more robust code. I think it's brilliant. But here, so what I've been talking about is that this challenge, and the challenge really is that uh, you have these non-transactional gaps that messages have to cross over, that you have to account for. And it doesn't matter if you're going to use Kafka or not. Kafka's not, you know, doesn't get, get rid of this, these non-transactional gaps. They're small. They're, the window of uh, vulnerability is small, but as your volumes go up, or, you know, do you want to have to deal with the fact that you lose just a few messages and get caught later on? It, so push versus pull. The, with the push approach, either approach is fine. Um, I'm a, I'm a, personally, I'm a little more of a fan of pull, but either approach is fine. So with the push approach, the general idea is that as uh, you need to deliver messages, you have to have some kind of a queue or list of pending messages to be sent. And for those messages that, that can't be sent, there's some kind of a re retry mechanism. So there's some way of once the message is sent and, and there's some kind of an acknowledgement that comes back, then that message is either pulled from the queue or dropped from the list or flagged in some way to say, yep, this one made it. But the, for the ones that haven't made it yet, it's constantly trying to send those messages over and over again. And there's a lot of different ways to implement this, but this is uh, basically the way it, it's done. The, the burden, there is a burden of responsibility on the message sender here, though, right? The message sender has to have all this plumbing in, in there to deal with this. You know, the, the, the bookkeeping of the message to be sent, the retry code, things like that. But it's a very common way to do things. Not bad. Again, it doesn't matter if you're even sending messages into Kafka. If you're building a microservice and you, you say you execute a transaction and then you're going to push a, a message into Kafka, there's that non-transactional gap, right? And either you say, yeah, I don't care if we lose something, fine. But if you don't do something, you're, you're set up to lose messages occasionally, you know, depending on the failure scenarios. The pull approach is a little different. The message producer still has to have some kind of a list of messages to be delivered. Um, but that's it. it it's just kind of creates this list or queue or whatever. Um, the message consumer has a responsibility for pulling messages. So it's a little counterintuitive because like in the case of the order and customer, order is you know, logically the one that created the, you know, the order created message, but it's the customer in this case that's actually pulling the message. It's got the code in it to try and keep up 
you know, as messages are being piled up on this say, queue or list on the order side, it's trying to keep up. But this is the Kafka way. You know, Kafka is kind of an offset-driven approach for, for pulling messages. So kind of the, the consumer kind of works its way through the queue trying to keep up. And again, it doesn't matter if it's Kafka on the other side, you still have to, you've got that non-transactional gap. So this gets into event sourcing and command query responsibility segregation. Anybody doing this? How many are familiar with it? You guys are doing it? Excellent. Excellent. Okay. Um, this is different because you get into that whole uh, area of changing data, right? So it, it depends on um, um, how easy it is for you to convince the powers that be to, to say, break apart a monolithic database or introduce this kind of radically different way of, of handling data. But the, the approach is fairly straightforward. The idea is that you're kind of building an event-driven system. And um, have, anybody, have you guys heard about event storming in uh, domain-driven design? at all. Um, event storming is, I haven't never participated in it, but I've talked to people that it have and uh, read about it. Uh, basically, the idea is that as you're going into like the design of your system, one of the things they do is they start out where they're trying to just like on a, um, with post-its, capture the events. They get the business people in there, they get the technical people there, you know, the domain experts, the te technology experts. They spend a couple of days kind of sequestered in a room and they kind of try and think of every single event that occurs in the system. And then they, they get all these post-its and then, then they start to use this to, to identify the, cup, the, the clusters of, of events, the, the, the messages. In any case, with the, with the event sourcing CQRS, the idea is commands come in and the uh, command is like a request to do something in the future. And then if a command is accepted, it produces an event. An event is like some, is something that happened in the past. It's really time-based. It's like order created. You know, so, so the command is create an order. Please create an order. That's the command, asking for something to happen you know, in the future. Order created is past tense, right? It's, it's the event. So these events are the things that are captured in the, in, um, the event log on the, on the event side. And the, so one exa uh, example is that uh, with, um, say, a bank account, the, the, your, your balance is the aggregate of all the events. It's the ledger, right? You, know, you're, you have deposit withdrawal, deposit withdrawal, deposit withdrawal. You sum all those up, and you have your current aggregate amount, right, of your, of your bank account. Same thing with an order. Add item, remove item, adjust quantity, customer information, shipping information, all these things are event. The cumulative effect of that is you've got your order, you know, say an entity, right? It's all those events that are getting stored. And the, uh, the idea is that now you've got this log that you can use to do some of the messaging that we just looked at a, a moment ago. The, on the, the query side, this is the CQRS side, you know, the command query responsibility segregation. So you have commands creating events getting stored in one place with a simple, relatively simple data structure. And then you have the, the query structures, you know, so databases for, for doing queries. Now, the idea is that this is a, uh, another non-transactional gap, right? You, you store an event, that's an atomic transaction. And then eventually you want to get that event and replicate it into the query store. So you, it's the same form of messaging. You have to have a reliable way of, of either pushing or pulling those events from the the log into the query side. Now, this is one of the areas where I think there's an advantage because say you're, you're trying to set up the data that's in optimal form for querying. So it could be that you want to store some of the data in a relational database because that's you know, great for querying, but maybe you want to store some of the data in a, a, a elastic search as well, right? So now you have the ability to start, and this is what I'm trying to show here, these, say these two databases on the other side, say one's relational, One's Elasticsearch, you could have another one that's, you know, a NoSQL, whatever. The thing is, is if you have a, a reliable messaging from the log into downstream, you have this ability to have uh, 
consistent data. You know, it's eventually consistent, but it's consistent data. If you don't lose any messages, it opens up these new opportunities to do things like this. So real quick, um, Pat Helen is a guy that is amazing. He's been in the business for a long time. He's been building reliable systems for a long time, and he, he's just this, he comes up with these amazing uh, papers and, and quotes. So this one kind of blew my mind. He, he said that the truth is in the log. The, the database is a cache of the subset of log. The cache subsets happens to be at the latest value of each record and index value from the log. What he's saying is that, and this, this again, it blew my mind, that the database that I've been using, the databases I've been using all my life were kind of this, the latest values. You know, the, the bank account, what's the current balance? Didn't that, this, or the order, is the current state of the order. It didn't necessarily have all the history that led up to the, the current state. And we, so basically we were, we were dumping all that history. We were throwing it away, right? CRUD, every time you do update and delete, you're, you're uh, throwing data away, right? We had to do this in the past because it was expensive to keep data. You know, machines were expensive, disk was expensive. That's not the case anymore. Now I'm not saying you just stop doing CRUD, but now you have the option to not do updates and deletes. And this is, you know, th this um, event sourcing in CQRS is a, an approach for doing this where you stop throwing away data. Now I know you have to, in many cases, throw away data for privacy or, you know, whatever different reasons. So, you know, I'm, I'm not saying you, you never throw away data, but um, I, what I'm saying is you have opportunities to save data for a lot longer. And uh, data is the new, what is it, the, the new oil is one thing I keep seeing, you know, it's like it, the gold or the, you know, the the real value at these days is data. So it's like every time you throw data away, you make a data scientist cry, right? So, um, and he, and uh, Pat Allen also said accountants don't use erasers. And again, this blew me away. I kept, I was thinking like, man, I've been doing updates to leave forever. And accountants, it never even occurred to me that accountants, <laughs> you can't erase entries in the book, in their books, in their journals. This one, another one, this is the last one I have of him. But this guy's brilliant. Uh, and he, he wrote this in the SO era, but I, it, it still applies to microservices. Moving to microservices is like moving from the uh, Newton's universe to Einstein's universe. And I think what he, what he meant by this is that in Newton's universe, time is stable. There was no fluid, the fluidity in time, right? Things happened in nice orderly fashion and everything was cool. This is kind of the way things work in like a relational database system. Uh, with a, with a, a nice database, one, one of the things that the database does is a marvel of, of engineering is that from the perspective of every single transaction that's performed, all other transactions either happen before it or after it. That's a real trick, but if you think about it, that's what databases do. Every trans, every, from the perspective of a single transaction, all other transactions were before or after it. This is the whole thing of serialization. You move to this new world, and that's kind of New Newton's universe. You move to this new world, and things are happening all over the place at different times. Eventually, you know, things break. They come back up. They catch up. You know, it's like, who knows when things are going to happen in the system. So now we're kind of moving into this bizarro you know, time field of, um, of, Newton, of Einstein's universe. So I mentioned that... Um, you know, with Akka and uh, Play using Akka or Lagam, which is just Play and, and uh, Akka, that we can do some of these things that I was talking, I've been talking about here. So there is an implementation of event sourcing and CQRS in Akka. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here. It's very cool. If you um, if you guys are interested, it's a it's it's all there. It works, and it works not only um, in a single system, but it works in a cluster. It works in a distributed system environment. And all these things about messaging that I was talking about, you know, making sure the messages get delivered at least once, and all the mechanics of pull and push and so on, these are baked into this, this technology. And again, it, you know, it's like um, entities, which are, say, the bank account or the order, the aggregate, is uh, uh, handled within an actor. So say... Every time a, a, a message comes in for a given bank account, if you implemented, say, a, a banking system with 
would this, uh, there would be an actor that handles that particular bank account. And it has the current balance in it, it has the current state. So it, commands come into it, those commands are, are created, uh, persist events, those events come back and say, yep, this persisted, that updates the state of the entity, and then on the read side, there's the right side and the read side, as it's called, the event log and the query side, right side and read side. Um, it uses a pull approach to keep up. The end result is that um, you're building services either with LogOM or Play or Akka and Akka HTTP. People are doing it all over the map with these different technologies. You can build um, microservices that can scale and uh, have a certain level of resilience as well. You know, so they're, they're built using some of these things I've been talking about. You know, they're taking into consideration things like not losing messages. And the, again, the, the, back on the uh, microservices, the whole thing with a microservice system is that if you lose a, one of the services, the system itself keeps, keeps running. But if what I'm trying to show here is this, with, with our stuff, you're kind of getting clusters within clusters. So the, the, the cluster, is all the microservices running together as a big system. The cluster within a cluster is, say, a service itself that's its own little cluster. And there, say, we lose a node in one of these ACA-based, LogOM, ACA, whatever, uh, approaches that the service itself stays up. So, almost done. Um, the some of the advantages that you get, there's some other things that uh, some people are talking about that I think are really interesting that, that you get when you start to have confidence that you've got an architecture where all your messages get delivered. And one of them is this, where say order and shipping need to use customer information when they're doing their stuff. And like an order, you know, an order definitely needs to know about customer, right? So you have two choices. One is that every time order, say the order microservice, needs to get customer information, well, it just does a get, you know. And, and this is a great place for REST, right? A RESTful HTTP get to retrieve the information about that customer. And that's fine. But that's a form of coupling, right? So every, you know, if customer goes down, that could cascade and pull order down, right? Because order can't do orders because it can't talk to customer. So the idea here is that Let's flip it around, that the microservice owns its own data, it owns its own schema, so say so you guys are responsible for order, you decide, oh, I'm gonna, we're gonna keep some information about customer in our own database, right? So every time customer changes, it emits an event, and your order service picks up that event, you're always gonna get those messages at least once, and you update your, your view of that customer, right? Or you, you, know, you, make, you, you record your view of that customer. So now when you need customer information, it's a local thing, right? So orders are coming in and you're retrieving customer information from your own uh, database. The, a lot of things are happening here. One is it's a lot faster. It's a lot more reliable because you're not, now you're not coupled to customer anymore. If customer goes down, who cares? The other thing is that how quickly do customers change? Not very often. How, how often do you want to access customer information? A lot, right? So if you, if say shipping and, and order have their own view of customer, which they're keeping up with, then you've got that level of uh, ability to, uh, to, to, to keep going when, when things break. And then one final part um, about evolving. If for you guys that are doing event sourcing and CQRS and building microservices that follow, you know, like, that really adhere to all those goals and everything, that's cool. But I've talked to a lot of people where they say, yeah, we're doing microservices, but we just split off the code. There's no way we're going to change that data, right? And because uh, I know this would have been the case at HP. We had data architects. It was a sacred, serious business, you know, data models and so on. And, and I don't know where they're at now, but I, I know back a few years, it would have been impossible for us to break apart data models, the big monolithic databases. But just want to throw a few things out. Like, what I hope I pointed out a little bit is that those logs can really be helpful in messaging. And it's kind of a stepping stone. That, so the idea here is that 
um, you start to in introduce into your system, maybe inside that monolithic database, you're starting to capture events, right? And then you, you kind of proliferate that a little bit. Now, it's still within the database. You haven't broken apart the database and things like that. You have to get you know, permission to do this, but say you do. And then the next thing is you start to pull those out, those logs out into a separate schema that you own. Now, you don't have to ask for adding this, you know, say this table or whatever into the big database. It's something that's controlled uh, by your service. But the data is still being fed from the database into the log, right? But now that you've still got this log, you can use that log for helping you to do at least once messaging delivery. Then you, you just flip it around. The next step is that instead of the database, changes in the database being fed into the, to the event log, th changes are happening in the event log first and then go into the database. You kind of reverse the flow. It, and it's just for some of them, right? And then finally, you cut the cord, right? So it's maybe a, I haven't heard of anybody doing this, but I always, you know, like try and think of ways uh, to um, sneak in stuff, <laughs> uh, you know, under the, under the radar sometimes. You, you, you got to push the organization sometimes to get things done. But no matter what it is, um, just, I know a lot of people can't just um, throw everything away that they've been doing and, jump into all this new cool stuff, right? It just can't happen all the time. Some kind, sometimes it can, that's great, but a lot of times it can't. So I just want to try and throw out a few strategies for, for doing this. One last thing, and I mentioned this before, um, data. We're, uh, you know, it's almost the end of 2017. This is a, a graph from IDC, a projection of the, the growth in the worldwide data. It's amazing. And I think this one's conservative. This is like a tenfold increase in the amount of data worldwide by 2025. So that means like, okay, in general, the systems that you guys are building and using probably gonna be doing 10 times more in a few years. I think it's gonna be even more in many cases, a lot more. Um, I just, I, like I said, I just saw some articles that blew my mind this morning, just this morning um, it, that I came across in Twitter, um, like, um, at least five devices for every person on the planet in maybe three to five years, you know, IoT types of devices. Another art, one article was about putting um, smart light bulbs. So every light bulb, say, is um, devices on the edge, IoT devices on the edge, setting up their own little fog, edge fog, right, on the edge of the cloud, all producing data. Um, some of that data, not all of it, but some of that data is coming back into the back end, into the cloud that you got to process. This is, I think it's going to be fun. <laughs> it's going to be real fun, a massive increase in, on, in what's happening. And um, we're the, you know, we're, we're, we started talking about reactive systems before it was cool. Now it's kind of cool. You know, a lot of companies, you know, Spring just came out with Spring 5 uh, with, with a uh, really nice implementation of reactive, you know, asynchronous, things like that. And, um, but we, we've been serious about this for a long time. And to me, I mean, elastic is good, but resiliency, I think, is, is important as well. And that's what I have. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That um, it, it it's a it's a matter. Of, sorry, the question is about the the log and should order. You know, the example we covered should order. Uh, does order need customer at all or not? And the point I was trying to make is that there are strategies for you to have really really independent services. Once you have the fundamental messaging worked out, if you've got a kind of a fundamental mess approach for messaging where all your messages are gonna get delivered and you're not gonna lose any that, that you care about. You know, if you, if you don't care that you lose some, which is you know, not unusual, that's fine. 
and you will lose some, and that's okay. But for the ones you, you, that you can't lose, there are ways to do that. And once you have that level of comfort, then it opens up the opportunity to have that loose coupling. And part of it is that because now customer can be admitting messages every time it changes a customer, the other services can be subscribers to that. You know, it's kind of a publish subscribe type of thing, right? Customers just publishing changes, doesn't care who gets them. But now the order service gets them and goes, oh yeah, I wanna, I wanna have my own view of customer in my own database. That gives it the order service a lot more independence. It no longer needs to reach out to customer every time it needs to get customer information, which is kind of the, you know, when you first start thinking about kind of messaging in these, these distributed systems, that's your first kind of, in, you know, your intuition says, oh yeah, we just go to customer, you get it, right? It's like, well, that's where you, you can start there, but you don't have to stay there, right? You could go to the point where you have that independence. And, and if you take that paranoid view, especially in the beginning with your architecture, where it's like, what's gonna break? So, so it's like have an antagonist. Like if you have a design, somebody play the role of the antagonist and come in and go, all right, that just broke. What are you gonna do about it? Or that just broke. What are you gonna do about it? It's kind of like the Simian Army simulation in a way. I just broke that machine. How's your, how's your system gonna handle that, right? To me, that's actually, it's a lot of fun in the design process and, you know, the, and, and, the, and in the implementation. Because when you actually design and implement something and it stands up to that and you go, yeah, I'm, you know, okay, I'm cool. <laughs> it, it handled that. Yeah. It, so it, it has a publish subscribe built into it and it hooks into Kafka, for example. So, and it uses these under the covers. You, you don't have to implement it yourself, but, and this is one of the big strengths of, with Logon. So the question is, does Logon have this built in? I have to remember to repeat the question. Um, the, it, it does. And that's kind of why I talked about it. it we, I don't think we talk enough about this feature of Logon in that it's got these capabilities built into it where it's doing a pull under the covers. So as a developer, we just write the code to say, I wanna push this message into a topic, which happens to go into Kafka. Under the covers, it's doing that pull because you know, the event's captured and then it's, a, it's pulling those events and pushing them into Kafka. And once the event got into Kafka, then it persists the offset, you know, like where am I at in the log? So it's, it's, it's kind of an internal bookkeeping of, of, of the, this, there's kind of this reader that's trying to keep up. And so the other thing is that the, you could have spikes in activity where say a whole bunch of events occurred, but the, the reader is struggling to keep up. It can't run as fast at some points, right? But it'll eventually catch up. Even if it's slower or because things break, it will always catch up. And every single message will get into Kafka at least once or wherever the message is, is destined to go. Th these kind of uh, mechanisms are already built into that technology. Yes. So the question is about scaling the reader, right? The, uh, the consumer of the events, like you know, the, the, the query side, right? And that's a hard one because it could be that, I mean, just, just by its nature, the log is a really simple data structure. It's gonna be super fast. It, it, it doesn't really, it, it could be a table in a database or it could be uh, you know, something in Kafka or uh, Cassandra, it could, or it could be something in Kafka as well. Kafka is being used for this, for the event log. Right, but inserting into that is like super fast. But it's not a very, it's not a queryable uh, structure. It, be, it maybe has, it's used that the uh, the index is like a timestamp and the entity ID. Um, so that guy can scream, right? But then now you've got the query side that's struggling to keep up. Maybe it's a relational database and you can only pump data into it so fast and it's going to choke. So some strategies are that you can have multiple readers based on some kind of a sharding strategy, which is built into Logon as well, by the way, that you can shard the readers so that they take ranges of indexes, you know, based on, you know, like a hashing algorithm or something, right? So you can have multiple simultaneous readers. <clears throat> but even there, 
Again, some databases can only go so fast, and they're going to, you know. But so that's a reality that depending on the characteristics of the system, you know, like the volume of transactions it has to deal with and so on, that, and just by the fact that you're going to have situations where you're going to have outages at, at times that you have to consider, that there's going to be some level of eventual consistency there, right? Um, and it's just a fact of life. So it's, it, it changes things because we're, in a way, we've been spoiled with a relational database. You know, we did a transaction, everything's there. You know, we've got the view of the data, everything's consistent. And if somebody goes, and every transaction, either other transaction happened before or after it, right? So you do one transaction, another transaction occurs, you're going to see that consistent view of the data. Here, you have one transaction to put something in the event log, and maybe later on it gets into the query side, but then somebody comes along and wants to immediately retrieve. So you may have to think about that flow. Is that um, what problems would that flow potentially cause? Is there a different way of, of looking at things? Um, one example is like with um, um, orders, taking orders. The, the one way of looking at things is that you only want to take orders for the inventory that you have. The another, the, so you, you, you need to have a consistent view of the inventory. And when the inventory is out, you stop taking orders for that item, right? The other way is no. By gosh, by golly, we're going to capture orders. So if, we, if you and I are trying to get this last book on the rack, and you get it and I don't, the system's going to take both our orders. And it didn't, it didn't know at the time when it took both our orders if we could ship both ours right away. But there's this kind of concept of assume the best and, and uh, compensate when, you, when you, it isn't the best or, or ask for forgiveness. It's like, the, you, you know, the system sends me, sorry, we took your order. The, the book is back ordered. It'll come at this time. Do you want to cancel the order or not? You know, when that might happen, right? So instead of being, it's really an interesting different way of thinking about how to, I think, do like processing flows in systems where it's like, um, be a little bit more optimistic, like things will work most of the time, and when they don't, just have a compensating way for, for dealing with it. All right. Yeah. Um, one is that, and this is kind of back to Akka, that the the idea is that you 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 funnel all the changes through one thing. So in Akka, there's an actor that handles that entity. So even though, so all the commands are coming into that single actor. It's a single ch choke point, and the uh, the idea is that all the transactions that occur for that entity happen through that actor. If you don't do it that way, you can have multiple independent transactions happening, you know, coming in from different threads, and that's where you can get, say, the uh, potential auto order, right? Whereas if all the commands are being funneled through the same thing, and this is, you know, it's part of ACA, so it's part of Logom as well, you know, back on the question about Logom. So um, that's how we deal with it, because it is something to be be considered is is when you're at that level of concurrency or consistency of the of the data and the transactions and the ordering ordering of things, you've you've got that uh, consideration to uh, to deal with. Any other questions? All right. Thank you.